if it doesn't become like that, then it's, it's just it's only intellectual, and that's the kind of knowledge we're discussing here. It's only intellectual. It's schizophrenic in the end. I'm not being rude. I mean, I'm probably being rude, but uh -huh. get my point. You get my point. So this is the you know, let's look then at how, from the Buddhist perspective of wisdom, how that impacts upon you as a person and makes you a better human being and makes you more connected to others. This is and it's very logical, you know. So the Buddhist model of the mind is very clear, but initially quite strange to us. If we look at the contents of our mind, the Buddha would say essentially you can you can divide all the contents of our mind, all our thoughts and feelings and emotions and unconscious, all these levels of, of, of feelings we, as we call them have anger and jealousy and love and kindness and intelligence and generosity and forgiveness, the emotional ones and also the, the intellectual ones, cleverness and sharpness and intelligence and clarity, all these things. That they, there's really they're all divided into three categories. There's no fourth category. This is not the way we talk about our mind, of course, in neuroscience and things like that, you know. So there are those states of mind that are neurotic, delusional, that are emotionally painful, and they're crucial, and they're the, the voices of I, basically, the voices of ego, basically. And, they're, and they're main, but their main function, their main function <coughs> is to cause whatever's out there to appear back to you wrongly this is literally the way to put it so if we look at these there's the emotional affliction the term they use are the afflictions but then there's the plain misconceptions i mean buddhism a lot of buddhism the world view of buddhism is very much about the views about how reality exists wisdom is absolute the wisdom of emptiness is absolutely one of those but also there's the view of karma that for the buddha is is his own observation he's observed the law that runs the universe is this natural law of cause and effect such that whatever a being's mind does moment by moment by moment it so seeds in that mind or it programs that mind that that then will ripen as the future for that person that we otherwise literally like we're own creators so the view Views about karma, the view about cause and effect, the views about emptiness, the view about no creator. All of these are philosophical viewpoints that are not just clever intellectual ideas, but they're, they're, they have an emotional impact, an emotional implication. Then there are the emotional the states of mind that we all are, are very familiar with, like attachment, anger, jealousy, love, compassion, forgiveness. So in our culture, we, we give equal status to all of those, and we would assume that we assume, we say that a normal person has a little bit of all of these, you know, these emotional ones. Some people everybody have a bit of anger, a bit of jealousy, a bit of depression, a bit of, a bit of kindness, a bit of wisdom. I mean, a bit of compassion and empathy. Clearly, we prefer to have more of this of compassion and empathy than anger and depression. But the Buddha would, would we give them equal status, and this is the radical difference in Buddha psychology. And this is the underpinning all of Buddha's practice, practice is that the neurotic ones, the voices of ego, are not at the core of our being. This is a fundamental point in all of Buddha's psychology and Buddha's philosophy and Buddha's practice, that they're not at the core of our being and that we can be rid of them. And now the question is, why would you want to get rid of attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, low self-esteem, or even the deepest delusion that clings to this deeply held misconception of an intrinsic self why would we want to get rid of these viewpoints these ideas these these approaches in our mind because the buddha says very clearly that of course you're suffering honey and the suffering is one that it causes you to feel concrete bereft separate from others lonely unhappy and then it causes you to be totally self-centered and therefore, they cause you to use your body and speech to harm others to get what I want, basically, to get what the I wants. Now, look at the world. I mean, look at the relationships between countries or people. It comes down to being anger, anger, depression, jealousy, how dare you, arrogance, attachment, you name it. You know, it's very simple in one way. <laughs> so the component, so the emotion, these emotional afflictions, these have this, also have this view, this component of being delusional meaning in a very literal way they are misconceptions they may misrepresent reality so at an ordinary level we can see this 
So attachment, for example, is an over-exaggeration of the deliciousness of something. It comes here from a, a feeling of not having enough, not being enough. And so then we, we, we dump that hunger, emotional hunger onto the cake or the person's body or the handbag or the money or you name it. And then it causes those things to look way more delicious than they really are and causes them to appear to be the cause of my happiness such that when I get them, my suffering will disappear. It's like this. So they're misconceptions. So the other thing in the Buddhist view is about the mind. And this, again, this is not the way we talk in neuroscience or modern psychology. There are different levels of states of mind. So the Buddha, coming from these genius Indians well before him, as the Dalai Lama says, and I always quote, it was these genius Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. They're the ones who delved into the mind using that brilliant technique that they discovered, they invented, called single-pointed concentration, called samadhi, that is, and the Buddha took that with him when he diverged in his own direction. Is this brilliant psychological skill that enables you, and it's immensely difficult work, to completely harness the berserk level of the mind, the level, the level that we only live at, which is conceptual and sensory. Conceptual and sensory. And we've got these, and Buddha have, they have found, and then the Buddha too, we've got these subtler levels of mind or cognition that are not sensory and are not conceptual. Now, that's just, that doesn't exist in our culture. We don't have, we don't pass at such a level of mind. And we have to, in the long term, to get out of suffering. And the Hindus found this to some degree. They didn't go far enough, according to the Buddha. That when you've gone to these subtle levels of mind, you can use it to unpack and unravel the mind and literally remove these misconceptions from the mind in order to get closer and closer to discovering your own true nature, which is bliss and clarity and joy. And therefore, because there's no longer these neuroses that are separating you from others, to then connect with others and have incredible clarity and, and compassion and kindness and empathy and connectedness. So this is, this is what the pursuit of wisdom is. It's completely experiential. Emptiness is an incredibly sophisticated concept. And yes, there are many views in, in of course, in modern science. There are indeed. But they won't get they won't get you enlightened. They won't get you to be kinder or, or wiser or more compassionate. They get you to become more clever. So the, the key point here is that these things that we call emotional anger, attachment, jealousy, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, you name them, we are very familiar. And we know the main component is this emotional, and that means physical. So we don't notice our mind, this is our tragedy, until it gets to the level of the body. That's when we, we talk about feelings. But that's the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. But when we start to rec understand those states of mind, label them accurately, attachment, anger, whatever, and then we start to plumb the depths of our own mind, utilizing meditation and our own internal daily job of being self-aware, we can learn to identify the conceptual story, the script in our head that informs that emotion. Anger is a conceptual story. Attachment is a conceptual story. This is very surprising. But when we get to see this, we're on track in Buddhist teachings of wisdom. And this is the starting point. Now, once you calm down your attachment, your anger, your anxiety, your jealousy, your despair, your depression, you are clearing out your mind. You're becoming more in touch with your awareness and your clarity and your joy and your contentment and your love and compassion and therefore connectedness with others. Because these are what stop that, these, are, these, these neuroses are what block us. These are what disconnect us from others. We can see it, look in the world. The more angry and more depressed and more jealous you are, the more lonely, the more miserable, the more horrible you can be, and the more separate from others. You can, and so right now, mainly our delusions drive the show. We, they present the world to us in terms of whether or not they will do what I want. So I mean, it's, it's super self-centered. It's quite embarrassing to hear it. So even as you lessen your delusions, Less in attachment, less in anger. That's the day-to-day -day work of being a Buddhist. Then you be, you become more joyful, more fulfilled in yourself, and naturally more connected, and more empathetic. It's just logical. And then you get all the way to realizing emptiness at the subtlety of your own mind in shamatha meditation. And then you cut any, and then you add bodhicitta to the mix, which it, which harnesses and energizes the compassion component. Then you finally become a Buddha where you are literally as if you are oneness with every being on the planet. Are we communicating?
So if, if Mr. Oppenheimer's actions can lead you there, honey, he was on the right track. If not, he's just living in his, I'm, wondering, I'm trying to be too rude, just be polite, living in his head. Yeah. It's also clever and exciting, you know, but it's clear, even a brilliant musician who's, or an artist, we think it was so fantastic in our culture. They can be the most self-centered motherfuckers, you know, excuse me, I had to say a rough word, I'm sorry. I mean, they can be really intensely self-centered and we honor this marvelous artist, you know. Being clever has got nothing to do with wisdom. The wisdom here has to be related to others and 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 uh, empathy and, and ethic in other words ethics and even I think in our modern I mean in modern psychology in general we don't factor in ethics you know we only talk about the emotional component it's very it's very curious but if you've got ethics which means you don't steal and don't kill and don't lie and not want to, at least try not to harm others you're on the right track. You know, you mightn't have a sharp mind. You mightn't get much wisdom, but you're going to you're going to be on the right track. And the point is, with Buddhism, ethics and the mind, all ethics and getting wisdom utterly, utterly interconnected, not separate tracks. You know, are we communicating, people? It's very delicious, really. Very, I think Buddha's great. I will say I'm a fan of Buddha. I like Buddha. <laughs> Hang on a second, hang on a second. Somebody here, Christine, you go for it, baby. Yes, sweetheart. Thank you, Venerable Rabina, for your teachings. I have been listening to countless YouTube videos. I feel like you're my new BFF. But Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm at my first rock star movie. <laughs> I'm happy, sweetheart. Happy to so I have two brief questions. Um, what I thought I heard you say is that I, I get that there's no inherent I. I get that. Well done. And that at the subtlest level, there is an I. And my question is, is at the subtlest level, is that I conjoined with all the other eyes? I'm I get interesting. No, it's a very interesting question, Christine. Um, there's a, it's a very interesting question. And the way you put it, the words might not be exactly right, but you're on the right track. So it's like this, you know, this idea of the subtle eye. It's sort of like the way Lama Zopa says, and I think that's what you're probably referring to in your head. Um, right, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll say that and then I'll go to some background. So basically, as Lama Zopa puts it, when you realize that there is no intrinsic eye, when you really have realized at the subtlest level of your being that there is no intrinsic eye or computer or anything else there's nothing that you can find that's separate from the mind that posits it it's he says it is as if there is no eye it sounds like there is no eye but then he says but there is an eye but what does exist is so subtle it's as if there is no eye so he's saying so this is referring to the two truths this major way this really skillful way to realize emptiness is in the framework of the two truths so the two truths are what they call of ultimate how things exist ultimately and the shorthand for that is emptiness and then how things exist conventionally and the shorthand for that is dependent arising so right now we have the two extreme views. So when we hear emptiness, we hear, oh, well, there's no eye. So chuck the baby out with the bathwater and might as well kill myself. So we basically this nihilism. And this is one of the commonest ways to misinterpret emptiness. It's way more nuanced than that. We can be forgiven for thinking when we hear the words from the side of the eye, there's not one atom of anything that makes it the eye. We can be forgiven for when we hear that for thinking, well, well, there's no eye. So it really needs a lot of looking into. And then when we hear the conventional reality, that they're you know, dependent arising, that there is an eye that does exist, but independence upon causes, conditions. So we then oh, we grab hold of that and we over-exaggerate the status of the eye. And that's the, the wrong view of eternalism. So we either think there's a big fat eye or we think there's no eye. We go from pillar to post like drunken sailors between these two extreme views of either there's no eye or there's a big fat eye. And it's more subtle than that it's more nuanced more subtle and really needs careful studying and meditating to get that okay are we communicating so we we're, are. 
the way to put it then, Christine, when you have realized the emptiness of Christine, mm -hmm. it, it, and you really added, you got, and you've added all the compassion to the mix, for you, it is as if your sense of I incorporates everybody else. There won't any longer be a sense of a separate I, put it like that. It'll be your experience as if you were oneness with all the other eyes. Okay. They like that. Thank you. You see my point? I do. Thank you. And Good my sec question, second question, uh, I have a dog and her name is Emily. And I thought I heard you say in one of the recordings that uh, at the animal realm, maybe all of the realms, that when the karma runs out, they might have an opportunity to be born as a human. And I was wondering, what does that mean when the karma runs out? Okay, darling, yes. So you can, if you think this, um, this idea of karma, one way of saying it is like the way the Buddha talks is it's every time you think or do or say something, you drop a seed in your bank. I mean, I, I say bank vault, it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. but you drop a seed in your in the ground and then you and that seed will then be nourished by your future and eventually it will ripen in a certain way. It will ripen as a type of rebirth. It will ripen um, as an experience. Let's say, let's say, you know, let's say you and I have a nice relationship and we're kind to each other and then we die. We'll meet again, let's say another life and we'll come in, we'll just bump into each other seemingly randomly, but it won't be random because we set it up by being nice to each other. And let's say we were nice to each other for a long time, but we put a lot of petrol in that tank and that'll take a long time for that relationship to finish. So if you've got a very short relationship with somebody, one day you wake up, that guy you were totally in love with, you think you're going to be together for eternity and you wake up one day and you think, well, who's that bloke in my bed? He's like, he's a stranger because the karma ran out there wasn't much petrol in the tank okay things don't last i mean i mean people get rich and they suddenly get poor they did they didn't have enough virtuous generosity mm. karma in their tank and they use it all up and then run out of money so it's like that you put a certain amount of gas in the tank it'll last you a certain amount of miles so when the karma runs out for like for an animal okay so the way it is with all of us we've got all got trillions of karmic imprints in our mind in our little bank vault of karmic seeds put it that way and so the, for the animal for your little emily was a dog or a cat it's a dog. A dog, okay. So there's little Emily. She's due to pass karma in the past life. One of her non-virtuous karmic seeds of probably killing was triggered, which gave her the, the dog rebirth. But there she is. She's got a lot of good karma. She's got Cat Christine taking care of her. She's, you know, she's a fortunate dog. So she's got lots of virtuous experiences similar to the cause karma, which is how she's seen and treated by others. And that's due to her generosity from who knows what life. So then she's also got lots of karmic seeds in her mind, millions of them. So your job with Emily, like any, or your grandma, is to make ensure that they, you know, that's why Lama Zobis book is so fantastic, How to Face Death Without Fear. It gives you all the way to ensure that Emily has a really good death and she's hearing the Buddhist teachings. And so then that can help trigger, help her become peaceful at the time of death and help trigger one of her many virtuous karmic seeds that she's planted in the past, which will then ripen as getting another human mother. Me. wonderful but the wonderful. karma runs out some things have a long I mean, some relationships last a long time i mean or even you can think of things like say you know east germany no matter how hard they tried that wall stayed there but one day no one tried very hard that wall just collapsed mm -hmm. the karma just it changed and that's in relationships in people's amount of money in their sickness and their poverty we, we sort of tend to think things are going to last forever if you're well, healthy i'm so healthy and then one day boom you get cancer your, mm -hmm. your virtuous karma ran out do you understand what I'm saying? Beautiful. I do. I do. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Good. Sunny. Please hug. I want to you say that Christine has questions. Oh, okay. Very good. She's done it. Yes. Good. Turn it on. Good, sweetheart. Yes. Good. Um, my question's around kind of how you reconcile Participation with contemplation because I'm just not. How do I reconcile participation? Yeah, so um, existing in the world and being able to live the teachings and then having that direct experiential knowledge of their work and um, the power of the positive feedback cycle of all of that. So, for example, I work in public health and social justice oriented work that feels really important and meaningful, and yet there are those who are much more orthodox and good, as the would suggest. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, okay. I get it. I understand, darling. So the, the third, the first thing to point out, what's your name? Meredith. Meredith. Meredith, good. Meredith. Okay. So the thing, the first thing is a different. Um, we can see in the world you've got the Buddhism in Thailand and Burma, for example, and then you've got the Buddhism in Tibet, you've got Buddhism in Japan. It's different, but the, the, this, the way to see that in terms of the entire Buddhist path, there are different levels of practices. So the first level of practice, which is the same for all Buddhists in every country, it's shared by, is the is the teachings which you see in Burma and Thailand, which is emphasis on the, the emphasis of the first stage is learning to get discipline, like junior school, Control your body, control your speech, live in vows, don't kill, don't steal, don't jump on too many on the wrong partner. Don't, and then eventually kind of you live a very humble, disciplined life. And why is because the way being in samsara is that you're driven by attachment and driven by, and that causes your body and speech, the servants of your mind to do harm to others. So the very first level of practice for one's own benefit is to subdue your body and speech. And then eventually you get to the next level, which is like high school. And now on the basis of having succeeded to some degree of harnessing your physical and verbal energy, you're living in discipline and vows, you're har not harming others, you become more content. And now you start to really start to meditate and get into your mind. So if you want to complete the wisdom wing, this is the the wisdom wing work if you want to commit the wisdom wing you would really then <laughs> the best way to do it is give up sex drug and rock and roll and go to the mountains and complete the job of getting rid of the delusions and get shamatha and you'd realize emptiness and you'd achieve your nirvana that's the wisdom wing sorry <laughs> that's the complete that's the completion of the wisdom wing hmm. And whether you're Tibetan Buddhist or uh, Zen Buddhist, that 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 is Buddhist teachings. That's where it is. But then you've got the compassion component, which is like the wis the compassion wing. A bird needs two wings: wisdom and compassion. And that in the Mahayana teachings is the emphasis on now cultivating. You come down from the mountains, and now you join the world. And because you've subdued your body, speech, and mind, and you've got some wisdom and clarity, now you can really add compassion to the mix and get out there and make the world a better place. That's the compassion wing, essentially. So it's not as if they contradict. In fact, you've got to do one before you do the other. If you, you know, you we all say, and that's something really important, I think, in our culture. We can all rush out there with our with our good politics and wanting to help the world become a better place. But if you haven't started to work on your mind, if you haven't learned to deal with your own attachment and anger and depression and jealousy, the world will just make you go crazy. You go kill yourself. Because we don't, we, we can't. Because we haven't done enough work internally, in order to really have the courage to get out there and never give up making the world a better place, which is the bodhisattva wing. Are you seeing my point? So you've got to do the wisdom wing first, and then you can also in your own life you can do a bit of this and a bit of that. You go off to retreat for a bit, come back and do more work. Or you get so many. I mean, some of my friends go off and they they do the retreat mode for years, and then you say next time they'll come back and help. Other people, I mean, for me, from day one, I knew that my job wasn't so much to do the retreat mode. I'm doing the wisdom wing internally in my daily life, no question, but it's to do with action and doing things, you know? So you've got to know the kind of person you are, what your personality trait is and where you're at in your practice. Because, of course, the Buddha's view is you're bringing it with you from the past. You've got a sense of where you're at in your practice, where you're at at your own level and what's best for you. You've got to know that. And you must. Some people can handle getting out there in the world and, and running around helping people not have it drag them down because they've done some inner work. Some people just can't cope. So you've got to know where you're at and what could you handle. That's really the, the essence of it. So there's no contradiction. There's levels of practice, and you have to know where you're at in that. Does that make sense? Good, uh, good, Meredith. Yes. Go. Hi there. Okay. Yes. Hi there. My question relates to this um, example. I I caught in one of your recent talks where you, you talked about you liked your coffee really hot. And then sometimes it would come lukewarm, and you would do this exercise of deciding right then to prefer the warm the coffee. Other way that's that, right. That's right. Yeah. Are there any other little practical um, things like that 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 you can recommend? I've, got, I've been trying to work on that one. Good. It's easier said than done. No, of course it is, darling. Of course it is. Any others like that? I understand. That well, I mean, yeah, of course there are. Because, and um, but the key to this is we have to see what the, the locate accurately, label accurately the problem. So let's say the problem is um, 
is uh, low self esteem. They say the problem is arrogance. Now, we mostly in our culture don't like to think we have arrogance, but it's a bit shocking to hear that if we've got low self esteem, which we love to admit to, it's because we've got arrogance. So, low self esteem is, oh, I'm hopeless, I'm no good. But then, or I'll put it this way an arrogant person, when they meet a person who's better than they are, will, will go to low self esteem. So they both, they both, all delusions have the particular function of exaggerating a certain aspect. So attachment exaggerates the deliciousness of something. So if I'm attached to my hot coffee and then it doesn't meet my expectation, which is meeting my, attach, my, my attachment's needs, I can, yeah, get another cup of coffee, ask it to put, make it hotter, or you practice and you learn just to accept that it's not the one and learn to like it. That's what you just talked about. So that problem there is attachment over exaggerating the importance of having what you want and then accepting. Accepting it is being patient and humble. You could say being humble as well, but it's also applying emptiness because you're changing the label, aren't you? I mean, you're relabeling it. Before, if you're really fixed on your coffee being hot, then when it's not hot, you call it bad. And then you get upset, which is anger. So that's that one. But the low self-esteem or arrogant one is a big one. I mean... Um, if you, you know, and we don't like to think we've got arrogance, but it's quite subtle that we've all got it, which is over inflating cer certain aspects of ourselves. So some of us might be good at certain things. And we automatically are comparing. We can't help it. We're very dualistic right now. We've got all this world full of separate individual people. So we can't, ego just can't help but be comparing. So you might be, you might have the, I mean, I remember, I still sounds like a joke, but I always talk about it when I used to do martial arts. I was very arrogant about my feet. I had the best Kung Fu feet. And I'm really serious. I have short, short little fat feet, not, you know, and they were really good Kung Fu feet. I mean, so I'm always checking one's feet, you know. You know I'm serious. I'm really serious. And it sounds so tiny. I remember school when I was a kid, Anna Lee, one girl called Anna, had the best hair. I'd be so jealous, you know, the best hair. Or some have a nicer ear. I mean, we're talking baby things because we're always comparing with each other in some way or other so being aware of that so then um with i remember with my kung fu i remember paulette she was sort of had these skinny feet i'm sorry if you've got skinny feet please forgive me <laughs> you got skinny feet and i was arrogant about my feet but she was better than me she had a breath she was a better she was better when we did um sparring she was more and so, so i would consciously admire her better qualities rather than just automatic i mean it's so automatic or you've got a better shaped body, or you're better at math, or you're able to make money quicker, or you've got a smarter mind. You know, there's so many things. Just catch it, catch it. And then the antidote to thinking you're more important is to praise something in the other person or rejoice. So when we're, when we're like, there's somebody I was talking to today, and you know, she's lonely or sort of, you know, giving up her partner. And so she, what she, like, well, this is common. You walk around the life and you see all these happy couples, everyone looks happy. Oh, she's got a family, and then oh, no, I really want that. I mean, it's a fantasy, you know. And then oh, I must be no good because I haven't got a partner. I mean, we have to catch our mind. So that's low self-esteem. Well, then a, a simple antidote is when you think you're less than you are. There's a nice saying in Tibetan. It's so simple. If you're feeling arrogant, tell yourself something you can't do. If you're feeling low self-esteem, tell yourself something you can do. I mean, they're baby little. Antidotes, you know, and you've got you've got to catch your mind and identify the problem. But the main one is attachment, always wanting what, always getting what, always wanting what it wants. I mean, impatience, annoyance, upset, irritated, they're just polite words for anger because your attachment doesn't get what it wants, you know. A million times a day. This is daily, ordinary. This is actually what Buddhist practice is. Nothing holy on your bottom, you know. I mean, you do it on your bottom as well, and then we go a bit deeper. But day to day is the application of it all. Do you understand? And catching the mind and then turning it around. I mean, that's it. And the more you know your own mind and you know your tendencies, the, the, the more quickly you'll get it, you know. Do you understand? That's what you mean, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yes, people. What else? Who's here? Nobody. Nothing? So what raises what, what, what personality? What, my dear? Say it again. What raises personality? Take the mic, please. Dive again. Yeah. Uh, what prices personality is you just mentioned as something that responding to her, uh, Maria? Meredith. Uh, Meredith. I didn't hear. So start your question again. So I heard my ear. What is the 
rises personality uh, rises personality personality as putting authentic instead of mine which is something we have to catch because it's always like a screen that I'm, just, I'm really to... sorry you have to forgive me but i just don't quite follow the point would you mean so kind of to say it no please shush sorry just say it in a different way Okay. Or ask uh, the question in a different yeah. way, please. So, uh, mind is something. Mind is something that is, it screens reality and doesn't allow. Mind is something that screens reality. What right. do you mean by I, that? Like it, it falls reality. It so, the mean. negative states of mind, I would suggest, oh, okay. if you have love and kindness and compassion, mm -hmm. that is more. They're more accurate states of mind. They don't exaggerate. They're more empathetic and connected, and they're more valid. So negative states of mind, such as attachment and anger and arrogance and low self-esteem, for example. So then go on. Question. Yeah. Um, um, so personality. So what do you mean by personality? Um, what do you mean by that? that? that, that, that. Inclinations, natural inclinations. Okay, that means your mental tendencies. Your personality is your mental tendencies. You know, you might be patient, you might be kind, you might be smiling, you might be jealous. They're your personality. So mind, personality, they're the same. So what's the question? What's your question? About that. No? Um, Think about it. Yeah. Is there a question from that? It's good. Try and persevere with it, please. I'd like to hear. What's the question from this? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Um, Are you making a point about the way the mind distorts reality? Is that what you're trying to say? Right. right. But, the, so, but it's the negative ones that distort reality. That would be the point. Can you see the difference? If you're more, if you're patient and kind and loving and generous to others, you're more in touch with reality, very simply. But if you're angry and jealous and depressed, you can't see reality at all. You've, got, you've just got your own little life. You know, you're stuck in your own head. Sure. This is absolutely the point. Of course it is. This is exactly right. That's the point you're making, right? I don't know if I were trying to make a point, but I do feel like uh, the... I cannot control my own states of mind. I, well, I join the universe, honey. <laughs> and nobody can, because we haven't practiced that in our culture. We don't learn it. Mm. It sort of seems surprising. We're grown up, and here we are, still can't control our mouth. Well, that's why the Buddhist view, it seems very surprising. That's why the Buddhist level of practice, and really this junior school and high school level, the way I talk about it, the very first level, don't worry about controlling your mind. Control your behavior first. Control your mouth. Control your body. If you think of the world... And you look at suffering in the world, people harming each other. What harms? Body and speech. So the very first level of practice is control your body and speech. Then you utilize that ability of being self-aware to now control your mind. And that is a really, this is a long-term job. I mean, this is a long-term job, you know, but, but we've got to control our body and speech first. If you can't control what comes out of your mouth, how can you possibly control the thoughts that drive the speech? You understand my point? So Buddhist practice, really, the first level is controlling the body and speech. Don't just vomit out everything you feel. Don't just say those angry words. Don't just say those critical words. And we, and we all do that in our culture. We think, I can say what I like. We're all full of speech. You know, we blah, blah, blah. Isn't it? This is a major practice. Then you start to become aware of your mind. Then you can start to change your mind. Slowly, slowly. Are we communicating? Good. Thank you so much. Yes, Sophia. Talk to me and then. Hello, Venerable. Hello, sweetheart. Um, my question is I feel a very strong entity at night in my sleep from time to time, okay. which is very heavy and yeah. dark. Have you discussed this before, Sophia? Have no, we? we have not. We haven't, darling. Okay, go mm -hmm. on. Okay. Yes. Then? And I would like to find a way to deal with this um... I understand. well you know there's many ways my feeling is it might be good if you email me about it Sophia it's really important to discuss okay. but I mean in general here I'll make a comment that of course from the Buddhist perspective there are more beings than we can see on the planet and there are certainly some beings at a more subtle level like they call they say it's in there in the spirit realm who are quite harmful and they 
you know, they can have, they can, they can harm us. People who see, hear voices, people who talk about having, I mean, people, especially in their sleep, because your, your mind is more subtle at sleep, you see, Sophia, but they're yeah. able to enter, literally enter into you. And people who can, who hear their, their, or people who can hear voices, people who think they're being told to do certain things. This is not just in the West, we call that schizophrenia. That can be actually living beings whom you have mm -hmm. a common connection with, who you're harming. And there are various practices you can do. So why mm -hmm. don't you tell me about it, sweetheart? Okay, I will. You got I... my email address? Yes, I do. Oh, darling, email me immediately, please. I can we can discuss. Okay. Right. Thank you, Renum. Good darling. Yes, Melissa. Unmute, sweetheart. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Venerable Ravina. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say, first, I want to say thank you so much for a teaching I attended in North Carolina, preparing for death. Um, you answered a lot of I had a lot of questions, which um, you were very helpful. So I came back to New Jersey, I'm loving my mom. Loving um, your mom, I'm so happy. You said, you said, <laughs> I, you said uh, love your mother, even if she was a shitty mother. That's and I was exactly like, right. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. I can Amazing. do that. Well done, so girl. We laugh a lot more. I'm sorry. I just, I wanted to say thank you. Um, the question I have, and I get to meet you next week. We have an appointment one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. I know you have a lot of students, so I okay. get to meet. Um, but the question I had was that in the care of my mom, we have a lot of family dynamics and uh, a lot of emotions come up. And I, I see the attachment. I'm good at zipping my lip. I'm good at practice. I'm getting better at practicing meditation. I'm following your instructions with everything. but. Yeah. as best as I can. The one thing that I'm noticing is the more I zip my lip, the the volume gets turned up in my head. Yeah, of course it does. And uh, that makes sense. I wondered if you had a recommendation for, I almost want to think like for a certain meditation, like, you know, because I have a, right now I have a, a specific person in my family who I've uh, had a major conflict with and I have ways of supporting my relationship with my sister and him, but not with him directly. So I wondered if there's a way, is there a certain meditation I can do, like exchanging yourself for others? Like, uh, yes, sweetheart. Yeah, absolutely. It's really a bit like with your mum, you know. <laughs> this per So this person is related to your sister or something. That's the idea. He's my, he's my brother in law. Okay, fine. And he had, and all this is around the mother and. Yeah. Her. Yeah, yeah. About, about her will and all that kind of business you mean all yeah that. just a lot of opinions and misinformation and just a lot of um he has this everybody has their he's carrying a lot of anger i know so well, i'm wondering i mean but i mean when it comes to his wife's mother does he have much of a say or people will probably think they all have a say don't they yeah pretty much she had six kids and they all think they have a say but it's my sister oh, and i the, well, my I'm sister sorry. and i the closest taking care of him I see. Okay. I live with my mom, and she helps out. So you so. mean he has views that directly conflict with your views? You mean about? Yeah, he's just, yeah, family. it's very. Yeah, he's just very like uh, different. He doesn't understand dementia. He doesn't understand um, the dynamic with uh, that we have in our family, which is fine. I I understand that part. The part I that see. What I'm trying to get at is, I mean, if if it really isn't a person's business, then you've got to be quite firm with them. But if it is his business, if he has got the right to have these opinions, then that's a, that's a different answer. So he has he, the right. Yeah, he has, has the, the right. right to have these opinions. He's involved. Yeah, in our, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, who's the main carer? I am the main carer. My sister's um, the main carer as well. There's two of us doing like six. So what he is doing is giving opinions to you two. But if you're, so this is again the point, if you are the main carer, then he can give you his opinion, right? But you don't have to yeah. take it to you. You don't yes. have to. Well, then he has to live with that. So you have to be firm and clear. And you and your sister have to be firm and clear without being disharmonious about her husband, that you guys have the right to make the final decision. And then he has to live with that. And you have to be very wise and let him have his tantrum. Yes. But can, can you and your sister be clear together with that point or does she get influenced by him? She's very influenced by him, unfortunately. So you mean it could end up causing an argument with you and her? 
Yeah, and, I, and I'm trying to hold that relationship. And you just have to, okay, you just have to, you have to, sometimes you've got to be just flexible. In the end, the main thing is for you to let your mum to make, to be loving and kind and supportive and she not see any of the garbage. And no. You, the main job with your mum is help her die peacefully. Yeah. So if you can do that and let them have their trips, then fine. Keep on track knowing that she's the main thing here. Yeah. Okay. And just if you have to give way sometimes, give way, you know. You don't want yeah. To, you want to give up. You don't want to fight with your sister as well. That's awful. No, no, no. That's the goal. It just mean, of course, it's going to be in your head. You can't stop that, sweetheart. You just can't stop that. I know. Well, meditation yeah. helps so much with. Um, what? Personally, I feel like when I'm able to be like just sit with with in meditation with like exchanging myself for yes. like you know like I it usually works. But I, I you know That's amazing. Not, I don't do know, it. I've been trying it. With <laughs> it's really wonderful. The key one is zip the lip, but then yeah. But then often our culture, as you know, what we tend to do is if we zip the lip, we tend not to notice. We just suffocate everything. That's no good. So have it, be aware of it, and then do those practices that work for you, your own private practices. That's really important. And really, yeah, and learn to, yeah, really just do what you're doing. You're doing incredible. You're doing incredibly. Scanji for Brothers is amazing. It's an incredible practice. Yeah. And then just, but stay, stay steady. And no matter what he says, no matter what, just make sure you, the job is to help your mum have a peaceful, yeah. happy death. Bottom yeah. line. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Good, Melissa. Thanks, Tommy. What are people? Yes. Hello. Yeah. So it's a little along the line of what this woman was talking about. When you have an emotion, it's fine to apply the antidote to things that are like coffee. But what yes. about when you feel People. gravely angry and I just so your mind is just completely berserk? I am so darling. We all know that. So, so the question has to be. For, so my question to you is: Is that raging happening in the, as right as the person is there, or while you're there and they're there? I mean, it's in, I mean, if it's happening in the midst of the conversation, then that's one answer. If it's happening on your own without them no, being no, no. there, it's okay. The insanity after the after after the conversation, okay. See, this is the part that's difficult. First, like you just this is the point you said. We we can't control our thoughts. I mean, if we realize, if we get to when we hear what these Buddhists are saying, and even the Hindus before, that you can actually get to the point of totally controlling every tiny thought effortlessly. It seems like science fiction to us. It's just, there's no there's no method like that in our culture. It's like insanity. And that's so it's a long way to go, baby. So that's why the first one is at least. Don't say, don't do the words. But our problem is we don't know. Our trouble is why anger gets so big and strong is because we don't notice it happening in at the thought level before it gets to the mouth. And that's when it's practically impossible. So at least if you can try and control the mouth and not do the harm, then find a method. I mean, if there's someone you can talk to, to cry it out, to speak, or even to yourself. But And then the, the other thing is then we get scared of it and we wish it would go away. Yeah. But we have to be brave to know it. You can't suffocate it. You can't make it go away. You've got to work, talk through it in your mind. But one of, the, so one of the practices, which is really hard, but you've got to have it like a little baby voice inside you because there are all these different thoughts in the head. And at the moment, anger is, like I think it was my roommate. And anger, the anger roommate someone the one that's shouting now shouting the loudest you've got to bring out your other roommates it's like that really it's like that and part and one of them has to be what's your name rebecca, rebecca sweetie pie honey child rebecca it's all right there's raging anger there but it's not your true nature and it won't last don't suffocate it's a part of your other you've got many roommates and anger is just one of them and they're just all thoughts and have a positive thought even tiny voice even though you're crying and you can't and try not to identify yourself because what we think is i am angry so you just visualize this angry person it's not i am angry it's the tibetans talk about anger is there jealousy is there so you've got these roommates that so really think of it like they've got many roommates and at the moment anger is shouting and yelling running the show but it's not your true nature it's not permanent it does not define all of you don't be scared of it try and hear it and let it have its tantrum but have you keep some sanity there the other roommates kind of calming you so it's all right don't you worry Rebecca. it's really okay i'm really serious you, you get and think of them as your roommates it's a really instead of i'm angry 
that it's I'm jealous, that I'm so special. We have this big fat I and we just think that's I. It's a mistake, you know. Anger is just one of your roommates. And we, we can't make it go away, but if you believe it's you and then you get guilt on top of it, you know, or think, you know, and then, or then you talk. And then the other thing is, okay, another practice, this is powerful. Is this a person you have a close relationship with? I'm just asking. I'm not having to say who it is. I'm not telling you. No. Is this the person? Is it a person you have a close relationship with? So is it, and is it part of the family? Yes. And other, and you all talk about this person? No. Okay, good. Well, that's good. So don't do that. No, I don't. I don't do that. They do that. Okay. Anger. Okay. That's right. Because that's what per perpetuates everything. Yeah. Yeah. Stop so talking work. about this person. That would be 90%. If you don't do that, you're, you're really being, doing a good job. And just let the anger be there. Try to have this other roommate say, it's not the whole story. It's not the real me. Try, because it feels like it. But don't be, and don't be scared of it. Let it, it'll, 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 you know, but as soon as you, if you feed in, there's a difference between just watching it and then having a conversation with it and, but, and feeding into it and, and approving of it. It's quite subtle, but it's very powerful and calm. It'll be all right. And then if you just really do that and do a bit of a practice, which the next morning you wake up, it'll be, you'll feel better. It's a really skillful thing to have to do, but no, it's not the only one of you. It's not, it doesn't define you. No, it's having, a, it's just this old habit. It's just a habit, you know, and habits can change. Do you understand? And just be brave with it, I swear to you. It's really important. Melissa, got another question? No, it's okay, darling. Don't worry. Who else, people? What else? You see, the thing is here, the point again and again and again, our problem in our culture that, you know, we don't think we have got a problem until it's severe. And I always use a stupid example, but it's so simple, but it's so intelligent, it's so, it's so obvious. It's like, you know, we know when it comes to our bodies, our house, our car, we have brilliant maintenance systems. We would never drive our car until the oil completely ran out and the wheels fall off and the steering wheel gets loose. We are watching the car like a hawk every day. We're checking it. We go to the mechanic and we adjust. Wheels just don't fall off cars on the freeway. Do you get my point here? Because we go to mechanics. But it's like all our emotional wheels are falling off and we only then go to the therapist once the wheels have fallen off. It's kind of demented. You know, I really, I mean, one of you might be a therapist here. And if someone comes to you and says, well, I got annoyed today, you'll tell a person to shut up and go home and wait till they want to kill their husband. But annoyance is this is the wheels wobbling. But we don't think that in our culture because we all have ordinary annoyance and ordinary frustration. And we just think that's normal life. For the Buddha, that's an indication. And if we can grab these things, that's why you have awareness of your mind. That's why you have to meditate every day to notice your bloody thoughts. Then you can grab them when they're conceptual level before they become emotional. This is, we think emotion is more important than thoughts. It's the exact opposite, I swear to you. Thoughts go to an incredibly subtle level. And then if you, in other words, you're angry emotionally because you've practiced the thoughts so often. It's an interpretation based on attachment, not getting what it wants. And if you practice and practice and practice those thoughts, it becomes just programmed and then the emotion comes. So we've got to grab it. So it, and that's why starting with controlling your body and speech first. It's, it's just so intelligent, you know. But we've got to really realize this is a, a pretty intense job. It's long term, slow process. You've got to have confidence that these thoughts are not intrinsic. They're just habit and they do not define you. That's why it's good to think, well, there's anger, there's jealous. Not, I'm angry, I'm jealous. That's a major shift. It's not just words. It's very powerful for the mind, you know. And the Buddha's view is why it's so encouraging to hear those teachings and to read the teachings about, you know, how the mind is naturally pure. This is outrageous. I mean, neuroscience will not tell you your mind is naturally pure. It sounds like a joke. You know, they're talking about the brain. We're talking about the cognitive process itself. The Buddha's point really is that virtuous thoughts, positive thoughts, clear thoughts, they're all rooted in wisdom. They're not quite wisdom yet. And they are our true nature. They are our true nature. And when we are more in sync with those, we are more in sync with, therefore, joy, because joy and contentment and happiness, this is really literal, are the components of a, of a virtuous person. A, a, and I mean virtuous in the nicest way, not some goody-goody fundamentalist religious person. 
kind, loving, patient. They're the qualities we're trying to cultivate. And they bring the happiness to oneself. It's quite literally true. But this takes time to see. And again, we give equal status in our psychological models to anger, jealousy, depression, love, compassion, kindness. Buddha has this radical difference. And that's exactly what nirvana means, is the eradication of all the neuroses, gone completely from your mind. That sounds like mental illness to us. We can't even imagine it. So we've really got to look carefully at the Buddhist approach, what he's saying. We can easily mystify it, you know. But it's encouraging to know that they're not at the core of your being, that the anger and depression and jealousy are these habits we've got, personality, like he said, very deeply ingrained because we practice them, but we can unpractice them. We have a saying, isn't it, that practice makes perfect. Tibetans have a lovely way of putting it. They say, nothing gets more difficult with practice. It's a much more humble way of saying it. Nothing gets more difficult. It never gets more difficult with practice. So we've got to have perseverance. And we've got to have this view by looking into our mind and hearing the Buddhist teachings on it. It's very encouraging that our true nature is the virtuous thoughts, the clarity, the kindness, the generosity, the forgiveness, the wisdom. These are who we really are. This is so encouraging. So that's why it's good to read teachings about Mahamudra and Sogchen and things like that, which talk about that. Because there's no, I mean, we all know we're addicted to hearing our negative thoughts. We are addicted to believing this is who I am. These are our tendencies, so strong, you know. So to even hear the teachings about how clarity and, I mean, happiness, even joy, even is our, these are our true nature. And we can, we can, and we the gradual practice of lessening attachment and anger, growing compassion and rejoicing and kindness is the method. To, not just to get happiness, but to method get wisdom. You know, because it's the presence of the neuroses that cause us to be miserable, and it's the presence of the neuroses that cause us to be separate from others. So the lessening of the neuroses brings both one's own happiness and one's connectedness with others, which is wisdom. Are we communicating? Good. Slowly, slowly, people. We have to have patience and perseverance. And this is where, too, I tell you, we just do not do it. We have to, the, the, the Tibetans call it rejoicing. It just sounds kind of like Pollyanna, you know. But this is, I find so interesting, the Western one, what do they call neuroscience? And they talk about, um, you know, creating new pathways in your brain, isn't it? Neural pathways. Well, guess how you do that, people? By having a positive thought. Do, do you, are you hearing me? Yeah. So it's obvious that thoughts are more important than the brain, if that's the case. You don't go into your brain with a scalpel and carve out a new neural pathway, do you? <laughs> you just have a bunch of positive thoughts. That's how, that's what neuroplasticity is. That's all it is. And it's like a revelation in the West. The Buddha's been telling us for two and a half thousand years. You can do it. It's called, you know, it's called changing your thoughts. So I met a friend of mine in Australia who hates Buddhist teachings, hates spiritual teachings, but loves think the idea of, you know, developing new neural pathways. And she and she was doing it and was basically having new positive thoughts. So I thought, well done, girl. She didn't think it was the same as what I've been telling her all the time, but never mind. So the thoughts are the point. So you've got to start with them. Having positive thoughts. But we just think it's so corny. And the thing is, when we have a positive thought, we don't believe it. I'm doing, I'm doing very well. No, you're not. <laughs> we think I tried, didn't work. You just keep going, you know, keep going. I mean, they, they did, you know, this is French monk who's well known. And he had his, he, he, he just did some meditation on compassion, not even fancy things on wisdom, just did thinking about benefiting others, visualizing compassion, thinking about benefiting others, and they could detect a change in his brain. So that just tells us from the Western perspective that we have to train our minds in having positive thoughts. But, of course, don't expect overnight to change. That's our problem, you know. We've got to persevere. You know, if you train your body, it's not going to, you're, going to, you're not going to look magnificent overnight, but you know it works, so you persevere. We've got to do the same with our mind. So one way approach we're discussing here is dealing with the shitty bits 
The other approach, which is the most powerful antidote, is to say positive things, you know, about the other person or about yourself. But it takes time, but you've got to have confidence in it. And if you like the idea of your brain, well, then the, the brain people are telling you it works. So, I mean, that might give you more confidence. So you've got to do this. And we just don't. We run to the negative story. Auto, it's the, Automatically, we run to the negative story about oneself. This is the irony of ego. And it's really so true, you know. And why is not mysterious is because we've obviously practiced that more. That's all. So have part of your practice. You know, you've got to see your rubbish. You've got to own it. But you've got to see it in reference to seeing your goodness because you can't just keep pointing out the badness. You get depressed. You've got to then assess. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine who's been practicing for years. You know? And I said, I mean, so admiring how, my, how you, you're much less neurotic now and improving now. And I said, you know, I'm, I mean, not quite those words. And she said she hadn't noticed. I said, well, excuse me, you've got to notice. If you keep practicing going to the gym every day, you don't notice you look different. You can just always be so satisfied. I'm not thin enough. That's how we are. We're never enough, you see. This is the irony of ego. We're never satisfied. We've got to practice being satisfied. I'm doing a good job. You come home from the gym, you're still 40 pounds overweight. You don't look any different, but you know you've done, you're doing the work. Same with our mind. You've got to notice it and rejoice. I can't stress this enough, okay? And But we think thoughts go in one ear and out the other. We don't think they matter. Now, that's why the Western one of saying it develops neural pathways, it gives us more confidence. Like we can see tangible proof, you know. So you've got to see your good qualities and see, and they're rejoicing your effort, rejoicing your hard work. But also, and that gives you when you can also praise yourself, you can also more, with more courage point out the rubbish. But if you only keep pointing out the rubbish, only keep pushing, 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 you you exhaust yourself. It's, you've got to see the progress. You've got to step back and see where you're moving, see where you're going and delight in your progress. I can't stress this enough. I really can't stress this enough. It's a, an amazing part of your practice. We have to remember it because we don't see it. That's the trouble. Because the default is it's not enough. That's the serious attachment. That's the serious suffering of attachment, you see. This one that Buddha says is the main cause of suffering on the planet. It's not how we think in our culture, clearly. That's why we have to know what he means by attachment. So let's look at it. It's multifaceted. So attachment is basically its key function. All these conceptual stories, anger, attachment, jealousy, they all exaggerate certain aspects of yourself, a person, an event, or whatever. So attachment, which is the main voice of the root delusion, this assumption of an I, ex over is um, it exaggerates the deliciousness of something. So we look at the first level of attachment, which is in relation to the sense objects, which is the obvious level. Attachment to cake exaggerates the deliciousness of the object causing it to appear to you as deliciousness coming even from the cake. And this is where it's very linked to wisdom as well. It appears the cake looks so divine, but what's happening also, the cake also appears to you as delicious and that when you get it, it will bring happiness. It will bring satisfaction. All this is instinctive. So when we have to, then we have to ask the question, why, is, why do I have that? Why, why do I see the cake like that? Where's that coming from? It's coming from dissatisfaction. And dissatisfaction is the result of the habit of previous attachment. So the fact is, Buddha is telling us when you, the cake looks like more than it really is. It looks like as if when you get it, you'll get happiness. And then if you look from your experience, you can prove that it doesn't. It's, it, you'll get disappointed because in the end, what it brings is more dissatisfaction. Because, you know, we know even... So let's, look, let's look, okay, let's do a bit more analysis about how attachment works. Another type of state of mind that's really crucial to understand is called happy feelings. There's one called feeling. In the, in the third category, you've got the negative neurotic states of mind, you've got the positive virtuous ones, and you have this third category, I like to call the mechanics of the mind. And one of those in there, like in, there's concentration, good memory, uh, uh, discrimination, there's, there's technical parts of our mind that everybody needs. I mean, 
thieves need mindfulness, as Lama Zopa says. Mindfulness is the ability to keep staying on track with something. So it's neither virtue nor non-virtue, but they're crucially important states of mind. So in there, there is a state of mind called feeling. This is quite a different use of the word. From the Buddhist perspective, there are only three kinds of feeling. Happy feelings, unhappy feelings, indifferent feelings. Well, forget the indifferent, okay? The key ones we all care about are the happy and unhappy. So the word pleasant, happy, joy, bliss, ecstasy, rapture, look, whatever level you like, they're all words for levels of happy feelings. And they are functions of the mental consciousness and the sensory consciousness. Now, our problem is we think attachment is, there's attachment not satisfied, which is dissatisfaction. It's the energy of attachment. So you're wanting something. You think something's missing. So then you think the cake. So this attachment then exaggerates its deliciousness, exaggerates its role. So then you hanker after it, and then you manipulate to get the cake. Why? Because you want the pleasant feeling that will be triggered when you make contact with the cake. This is the 12 links of depending or rising. That's, that's the habit. So the fact of the matter is a pleasant feeling is triggered when you put the cake in the mouth. We know that. So, so, so then that's called happiness. Another word for pleasant feeling is happiness. But our problem is we're so mistaking what happiness is. We think it's a function of the cake. When you, you know, I'll tell you, you I'll say to you, please tell me about, oh, you're looking so happy, Rabina. Tell me about it. And I'll proceed to describe my boyfriend. Why? Because I believe he is the source of the happiness that I'm feeling, like he injected happiness into me. We believe the cake is the source of the happiness. We believe the event, the thing, the weather, you name it, is the source of the happiness. So attachment is this junkie that, that, that makes the cake look, look more delicious than it is. And then we totally believe the story that the cake is then the cause of the happy feeling. And we're not wrong in saying that it does trigger a happy feeling. Buddha's saying it does. But honey, he says, you've got to notice when you do the analysis that it's, it's, it's quite, it doesn't last. So look what happens. Look what happens. This is the tragedy of samsara. What happens, all is happening simultaneously. So the, you've got the hankering, craving, what's missing? Oh, cake. Get all excited. You start visualizing. You go getting it. You do it. You get the cake. It's on the plate. You can't wait. All anticipating. Attachment is emotional hunger, hankering, expectation, possessiveness. All of that's a function of attachment. And all playing out here. Can't wait to get the cake. And you put it in the mouth, and what happens instantaneously, excuse me, pleasant feeling is triggered through the senses, consciousness, sense consciousness. You definitely get a pleasant feeling, but look what happens. Attachment's right next to it, and the millisecond that pleasant feeling comes, attachment is not satisfied. It's not enough. So what do you do? Put another piece in. Isn't it? Even as you're having the pleasure. Even as you're experiencing that pleasure, attachment saying not enough. Are you hearing me, people? So that you, so then you, you, you so then you, even as you're having that mouthful, you haven't even finished it. It's so delicious you can't believe it. You're already anticipating attachment, anticipating the next mouthful. Like the boy in Sex AA said, he's, as he's on one girl, he's anticipating the next one. Or like the girl who went onto Tinder is getting dressed and looks over at the boy and he's already on Tinder getting the next girl. That's how attachment works. It's a bottomless pit of dissatisfaction. It's like a nightmare. Even as you are having that pleasure, attachment right next to it, the two different parts of the mind, is saying it's not enough. So the attachment is already, so you're already disappointed. So then you, oh, anticipate with excitement the next mouthful. That'll, that, that's the one that'll do it. And you have another mouthful. And the next one will do it. And then you have a second piece and third piece. And before you know it, you're now, the attachment is completely turned into disgust and aversion. And if you ate another piece, you would vomit. This is called samsara. Yeah. Are we communicating? Yeah. This is scientifically provable. And we are addicted to this system. So what Buddha is saying is, 
sorry guys, I have found a method of how to get happy feelings, the likes of which you would not believe, they're so joyful, which happen to be your natural state. And the method to get them, your method is you get happy. The method to get happy feelings is to get the object of attachment. But he says, no, no, no. My method is to give up attachment. And what you're left with is just joy and bliss. This is your natural state. Are we communicating? Yeah. So we're all junkies, basically, trying to give up attachment. And attachment is also multifaceted. Attachment is dissatisfaction, because every time you try to get the cake and get the happiness, of course you're disappointed. It's sort of like you've got a 50 buck note, but you think it's worth 500, and you've believed it so strongly, it looks like 500, and you build up the story and the anticipation, and you go to spend it, and of course you'll be bitterly disappointed, because you want to get 50 bucks worth, so you build up your dissatisfaction. So dissatisfaction is the disease, and we are born with it as a result of having practiced attachment. And we keep bashing our heads against brick walls, convinced the next mouse will do it. And our body is the product of attachment. We're, we're walking junkies, basically. This is what Buddha means by samsara. So it's quite long-term, quite subtle, quite amazing psychology, quite brilliant analysis, actually. It's not moralistic. Are we communicating, people? Yes. Good. So keep practicing, please. That's why you've got to rejoice and learn to be content. Learn, even that's why you've got to practice. First, the first practice is leave your hands in the lap and don't have the third piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing we don't, we don't want to do because we feel disappointed, but that's the practice. So you're practicing being satisfied. When you're attached to food, we all, I mean, most of us are attached to food, right? I'm attached to food. And I know as a kid, I, I never could tell the difference between a stuffed stomach and being satisfied. That's what you think it is, you know? We can learn to be satisfied. Of course, it's painful in the beginning because you just keep wanting that next piece of cake. But your stomach being full has got nothing to do with satisfaction. So satisfaction is mental. So you have to practice it. Practice it. That means practice being satisfied with your progress. Practice being satisfied with what the level of practice you're doing. And you've got to say the words, develop those neural pathways, you know, say the thoughts. Because we might not, we might give up attachment to cake or boyfriends even, but we're not satisfied with ourselves. We've got to be satisfied with ourselves as well. So important. That this is practice, people. And then you can rejoice in other people. So, you know, Melissa's point about her, you know, brother-in-law, like your point, you, you see, you know, you can call like you can see with your mum, you just simply try, you know, one of the one practice is you have to be very clear with him, like we said, no, no doubt let him, you know, but you can see his good qualities as well, try and see his good qualities as well, but stay in a situation like yours, you've got to stay firm, but another thing like you just, in different scenarios, you know, but it's seeing good qualities in someone where you always see bad. Yeah, anyway. And when we realize that all these emotions that we call are, we're living at the level of conceptuality. They're all rooted in being conceptual stories. But we're so familiar with them that we feel them as emotions. We've got to unpack them, go underneath, unpack and unravel them, and hear this, the script in the head, I tell you. This is a long, this is our lifetime practice. And it takes time, but it's possible, okay? Time is it? 8 14. Oh, time to go home. Mm -hmm. Time to go home, folks. No. Any more urgent questions? Yes, sweetheart. Um, thank you so much, uh, Venerable Ravina. Um, I have a question about cultivating very strong discipline in the practice when you when you have like propensity of greed. Or like, a what? A what? Greed. Who? When Which I, word? Greed. Oh, greed. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by greed? Say like, you know how they well, like God she has so much merit, and so they just have all their like desire fulfilled and they have fun all day long. And then so when you have a very um happy life, how do you still uh, cultivate um this and not be so, so what do you mean? So okay, Practice. so okay, using the Buddhist view, so what you're saying is there you are, let's say yourself or whoever you're talking about, that good things happen. So good things happen. You're talking about some things, good things happen in your life. Nice things happen, yeah? Is that what you're saying? Which is the fruit of your past virtue. So then 
um, so nice things happen. So first of all, what's your attitude to that? Do you rejoice in that? Do you delight in that? Do you rejoice in your past virtue that you must have had some virtue of generosity, for example, that you get anything at all or even have a job? And this is a very major practice if you take about talk about karma. You should rejoice in your past virtue. So then where does the discipline part come in? Um, and I notice sometimes I feel I'm a little too lazy in my Buddhist practice. Okay, so there you have a nice life and things happen and are lovely. Your attachment is getting what it wants, right? And so you have to rejoice that you practice the virtue to get that, delightful. But then you're saying that prevents you from having a discipline practice. Is that what you're saying? Yes. You get captivated by all this lovely life. Yes. Okay, join the universe as well. So we're either captured by the lovely life and we can't do our practice, or we get so depressed by the miserable life we can't do our practice. <laughs> either way. <laughs> Darling, you just have to, and you said very strong discipline, to start humble and think simple discipline. Do you have any practical? Yes. And you do, okay. Um, do you, what's the, so you have to know, the only reason, okay, there's different, they talk about, we discussed this last time, in the Mahayana path, they talk about the six perfections of the Bodhisattva, and one of those is the development of enthusiasm or joyful effort, and it's quite difficult. So we have to look at the opposite. The opposite is attachment, so just like you're saying. So attachment, so when the very first one is you think of your practice and you go, oh, I can't be bothered. That's the first kind of laziness. And then you analyze, what, I, what can't I be bothered doing? making the effort to do what attachment doesn't want isn't it so you've got to go against attachment so the very first level of laziness is can't be bothered mm -hmm. because it takes and then you've got to analyze what is it that takes effort the thing that takes effort is the thing you're not familiar with so if you're really good at your practice you, you would have grown that little track in your mind and you would run to it automatically so so you, the laziness is I can't be bothered because you've got to make effort. So then the thing that attachment doesn't want to, that prevents you from making effort is what is attachment just wants to be comfortable. So attachment is us being in our comfort zone. We want more than anything, the most primordial way to talk about attachment is to be in our comfort zone, mentally and physically. So now then the only reason you're going to make effort to do anything is you have to know the benefits of it. So what would be the benefits of doing your practice? Um, be very sincere, not theoretical. I know it is very sincere to be really be free from suffering. To be what? Be free from suffering. Well, so that's very theoretical. It's sincere, though. But it's sincere. Yes. And the suffering of attachment and all the delusions and the ups and downs, you mean? Yes, I okay. spent a long time contemplating. I understand that, darling. So then you really, that's the reason you'd like to practice. So you have to know, you have to be convinced of the benefits. The only reason you'll ever make effort to do anything is if you are confident about the benefits. Without knowing the benefits, nothing will persuade you to do it. So you have to just, but then, then you have to start small and humble. You said very, something like extensive discipline. Please be a bit more humble and have a simple discipline. Do you do a little bit, so start with, a, I mean, in our Tibetan tradition, we have certain commitments to do practices. Do you have the same? Uh, commitment yeah. to do certain practices yeah. do you keep your commitments uh, i have too much that i can't commit to all. no no okay no what i'm saying is we have i don't know do you have a tibetan style or a different style practice i'm no. not trying to be superstitious yeah. yeah okay well normally if you take an empowerment or if you've taken vows you have a certain commitment you've agreed to it do you haven't got anything like that have you taken yeah. refuge? I have so then you've agreed, you did, basically when you took refuge in front of somebody, you shook hands with them and you made a, you did a contract and you, you agreed you would say refuge every morning and every night. You agreed you would try and offer your food to the holy, to the, to the triple gem. You agreed that you would try to be nice to sentient beings. You got to, you got to look at what you're committed to doing. There's only three or four things. And I think if you thought about it, you probably do keep it, but you've got to know what those commitments are and you wouldn't want to break a contract with somebody. So then you have a wish to keep your contract with that person. So then in the morning, you make sure you get up in the morning. You, you, have, you have an altar mm -hmm. and you like your altar. Mm -hmm. It's pleasing there. Mm -hmm. So do you make your offerings on the altar? Mm -hmm. You do every morning. Well, honey, you're keeping a commitment. How marvelous. So rejoice. So you do it every, you just said every morning. Mm -hmm. So what don't you do that you think you should do? I want to do 100 to 300 frustration a day. And sometimes I get lazy. Okay. 
So you've got a life as well. You work and study and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And you've timed the 300. You know how long it'll take you? 300 takes an hour and 100 takes 20 minutes. And I get distracted when I'm frustrated. I understand. So you get distracted when you're frustrating. Well, it's a bit hard to get distracted when you're puffing and panting. No. I mean, come on, girl. Well, okay, you've got to be, are you being realistic with yourself? How long have you been telling yourself you think you should do 300 frustrations? A year, a month, 10 years? A few years you've been saying it to yourself and you've never succeeded. I start to do it a bit and it's a good momentum. Then I and then what happens? So have you got a commitment to do the 100,000 or you just want to do the 100,000 or what? I, I, I don't have the commitment that I really want. Okay. So how many could, so I, maybe you're not being realistic with yourself. How many could you stick to? You could why don't you just be a bit humble with you? the way you talk, you're a bit demanding with yourself, you're a bit fanatic with yourself. The questions are sort of very grand. So be a bit more humble, maybe. When I mean, you do your offerings, have you got a llama? Are you close to your llama? You have them in your heart. Well, you should practice that. Devotion is a very powerful quality. Devotion is like an open heart. And I think if we have a, like, you know, even if you're just practicing music, if you really like your music teacher, you want to please them. Mm -hmm. It's very humble and nice to have that. Then that energizes you a lot. Not just you, little isolated me, being disciplined. But if you want to please your, this is a very powerful question. I mean, that's why I said, do you have a llama first? If you didn't have, I wouldn't be saying these words. If you do have, it's a major part of your, why you will do your practice. You want to please and you get pleasure from it and you'll be delighted. So start humble, please. Rejoice in what you are doing and do a little bit and try and want to please and visualize the guru as the Buddha. And this brings richness to your practice. Are we communicating? Yeah, that's very good. Feed your heart, sweetheart. Okay. Feed your heart okay. and rejoice, please, mm -hmm. in what you do accomplish. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Good. Yes. I think all this is lacking of that in a sense. Um, I'm very fortunate to have met some incredible teachers, but so, can somebody un can someone unmute themselves? There's a bit of racket going on. Can you somebody unmute themselves, darling? Sorry, whoever it is, go. Yeah, go, go, sweetheart. Um, so practices which have been sometimes overwhelming. Only... Practices that have been overwhelming. What are you saying then? So certain realizations of gradual kind of deconstruction, which have felt. That sometimes depersonalizing. I'm a bit very, lost. Start again. Um, I think what I'm trying to get at is sometimes practices feel like they're doing more harm than good. Practice is doing more harm to you than good. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. I mean, this is a bit shocking statement. What do you mean by yeah, that? Okay. So what do you I mean, sweetheart? Like what do you harm. mean, darling? I mean is sometimes the kind of hyper obsessiveness when you are doing this work and you're continually letting go. You become aware of oh, I'm letting it go, I'm letting go all the time, and it becomes this. I know it almost feels like I'm getting stuck in my head, as opposed to. So the practice isn't the problem; it's your attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. Well, it means you've got to. We, 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 like, you're a bit like you're a bit fanatic. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, it's good to be fanatic if you can pace it. I mean, fanatics, Lama Zobra was the most fanatic person you could have. He didn't sleep, he didn't eat. I mean, he was like the fanatic, insane bodhisattva. Like, dement makes you tired to think about him. But it was paced and according to his capacity. But you have this disconnect between what you think you should be doing. That's that kind of mind, which is very dangerous. So relax a bit about it, please. Really, really, really relax. It's important. I mean, if, it, if, what, if your attitude towards the practice causes you to give it up, it's because you're being too obsessed with it and too fundamentalist. Put more emptiness into it, more spaciousness. And rejoice in your good qualities, please. I don't look like we're communicating. Yes, I de definitely. I think, um, as I said, that the part I think I struggle with. Yeah, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Say what? Come on. Um, I think the more that I encounter like the emptiness, and I can't really hang my hat on an eye. 
So hang your hat on what? An unbeautiful fixed eye, like as more that I encounter, really go deeper and deeper, and there's just nothing there, I guess. Nothing there. Well, now you—that's nihilism. You're becoming nihilistic because if you're realizing emptiness properly, it's giving. Mm -hmm. It should give you joy mm -hmm. and and a sense of connectedness with others. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you, you're on, you got the wrong end of the stick, sweetie pie. So keep studying and keep purifying and don't and try not to make it yeah it sounds like a bit nihilistic what you're talking i think it's more it's definitely brought up a lot of attention and i, I guess you're right just about that this is the incorrect interpretation seems like i think so because it was in the right interpretation to make you more happy more relaxed mm -hmm. definitely so give it a break mm -hmm. and rejoice in your good qualities please mm -hmm. i swear to you so then lisa then we finish Lisa, Lisa, sweetheart, talk to yeah. me. Hello. Okay. Lisa. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Lisa, talk to me. Um, so one of the things, I am so grateful that I was able to be part of this because I sure. really I really like what, what resonates that you've said is that when anger arises, like you're not identifying with it saying, I am angry, but you say anger is arising. Uh -huh, sorry. And so then... One of the things that confuses me, and I don't know if this is something you can talk about like the next time is I don't understand, like, I don't understand the whole emptiness concept. Like when you say anger is arising, I like, it's not me. And then yeah. it, I've heard that emptiness is like, there's, um there's no I in it. And I then it, yeah, throws everything, it just throws everything into confusion. I know. Well, don't worry then, Lisa, leave it like it is. Just say, you know, even just even thinking this way. It's not the I that's being angry. The anger is there and it's one part of Lisa. Don't worry about that. Just say, because Lisa, there is a Lisa, just not the way she thinks she is, that's all. There's not as if there's no Lisa. Lisa does exist, but in a way that we don't realize. So relax about it and think that anger is not the real Lisa. Anger is not the only part of Lisa. Love is, and identify more with your positive qualities. Just think I in a conventional sense. And then slowly, slowly, darling, as we hear the teachings on emptiness, it'll start to make sense. But don't push it, sweetheart, and don't have it contradict. Because emptiness doesn't contradict reality. The okay. emptiness of Lisa doesn't contradict the reality of Lisa. Remember those words. Don't chuck the baby out the bathwater. Okay, because that's really put a lot of confusion in me. Then who is the I that is? Like, it's just so confusing. Exactly, darling. So leave it be, sweetheart. Okay. And we can talk about it more next time. You're absolutely right. Okay. Okay, Lisa? Yes. All right, Thank darling. You. Thank you, sweetheart. So time to go, Thank you. I suppose, yes. Thank you, everybody. So we delight, we rejoice. Here we have all been. A few thoughts happened. Try and internalize some of it. Try and have confidence in your own marvelous potential. Don't identify with neuroses, but be able to have the courage to see them because they're, the part, they're the parts that cause you pain. Try and be realistic with yourself. Be a bit humble. Be optimistic, but humble. And pace yourself and delight in your good qualities it's it's got to, you got, got you do your purification practice at the end of the day then you've got to rejoice in your good delight that you've done your work delight that you're practicing be happy say the words i'm doing a good job you talk to yourself you say positive thoughts i cannot stress it enough please take that mostly away from this okay that's it, people. And then from our point of view, Lama Zabramisha, he passed away soon. So we just do this little in our thoughts, a swift, the swift prayer. His Holiness written a swift, a prayer that Lama Zabra come back quickly to continue to teach us. And if you haven't met him, may you meet him when he comes back. That's it, everybody. Thank you, darling. Thank you so much. Everyone, happy to see you all. Thank you. Love you. All right, sweetheart. Bye. Thank you, darling. Okay.